and just telling students, I see this in you right. and let's see how far we can go. Okay. You're struggling here. Let's see how far. And I just think, you know, we learn from, we learn from the hardest times, sometimes the most, even though they're the most painful. And, you know, I, I think there's so much we can give our students if we're vulnerable enough to not just look at the music skills, but to also see them as people. Welcome to The Choir Baton, a podcast designed to engage with people and stories, ideas, and inspiration stemming from choir. No other art form, no sport, no hobby, no business requires a group of people to execute a communal goal with just their voices. Join me, your host, Beth Philemon, as I interview guests who are singers, teacher conductors, instrumentalists, and community members. Together, we'll ask questions, seek understanding, and share insight from our experiences in life and in choir. Well, I haven't told you this actually, but you were my first podcast, like back in the saddle. And oh, how exciting for you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Emotional actually, as I'm even saying it, um, because it's been crazy and I'm so excited to be like recording a new episode and um, you are like, I just shared, you were the perfect person to do this with because uh, I just admire and, and look up to you so much. So thanks for joining us, Jessica Grant on the Choir Baton podcast. Well, thank you for having me. And I'm just so happy to talk with you and to share about life and music and everything. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, I want to give a little context as to how we got connected. And I mean, also just extend thank you to you. I, the first connection we had was when you asked me to be on your podcast and admittedly, I didn't know a lot about you at that point. And it's probably like one of the, my favorite podcasts I've done because it was just like meeting an old friend. <laughs> Um, and, and ever since then, I have just felt this neat, like kinship and connection. And I'm like, I would be friends with you if we weren't like music teachers and I, you just do cool things. And so, yeah, I I'm stoked for us to jump into that because we all need to embody, um, a little bit of Jessica Grant in our lives and that with how you live your life. So I didn't realize I was doing research. You graduated from college in Tennessee. I did. Yeah. I went to Lee university, yeah. which is in Cleveland, Tennessee. And in fact, the story's kind of wild. My whole life is kind of like this where, um, basically I've just always struggled with, uh, believing in myself or believing that I was good enough. I think a lot of educators struggle with that. And I'm coming to realize more and more that I'm not alone in that. Like I always felt like everyone else had it all together and knew what they wanted to do, but I really wanted, and this is wild, but I wanted to be a flight attendant because I just love caring for people and I love helping people. And so I wanted to do that or I wanted to perform as a dancer and like have a dance studio. So I had gotten my, uh, well, let me back up. I had auditioned for the dance department at Hope College in Michigan and because it was expensive for our family, I really needed this particular scholarship to go there. But in the meantime, while I was waiting to hear back, I went down to Lee to visit because my pastor's daughter had gone there and she was like, it's amazing. You should really do it. And when I went on the campus and I auditioned for the music department, I was like, this just feels like home. And I really made the choice right then to go to Lee. I got home and I found out I had received the dance scholarship at Hope. And I was overjoyed, but at that time I was like, you know what, this isn't the right path for me. And I chose to go to Lee. And while I was at Lee, I felt totally inadequate. I was around all these musicians. I was really shy growing up. So my parents never heard me sing until I was 18. And then when I had to audition for the music department, my mom had to accompany me because she was the only one that could like come down. And it took me like weeks to even face her and sing in our living room. Like I would turn around and I have the most like loving, amazing parents. 
but it was just one of those where I just never felt good enough. And then all of a sudden to be doing vocal juries and to be singing in front of these vocal majors and to be performing and sharing and doing this music degree that I felt like was what I was supposed to do. But I would always tell people, I don't know why I'm doing it. I'm never going to use it. And so after college, I still wanted to be a flight attendant. And I'd kind of given over the, the dance stuff and been like, I'll just, you know, enjoy dancing. I mean, I don't do clubs or anything like that, but just like right. dancing at home or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I didn't go right into teaching because I graduated in December. So I ended up working at my church and Northwest Airlines at the time had a hiring fair. I got hired to be a flight attendant. And this was in 2001. So like right before 9-11 happened. And two weeks before I was supposed to go to Minneapolis to do my training, um, everything fell through. They rescinded the offer. It was so devastating. And um, I mean, on a personal note, I'll share that I had been engaged and my boyfriend broke off our marriage as well. So I was dealing with that. So it was like, here the relationship went, here the job went. I was just feeling super helpless. I was living at home and I just felt kind of purposeless. And my mentor calls me from my student teaching and says, and mind you, this is August now. This is the middle of August. And he goes, there's a job opening. It has to, or uh, there's a job opening and it is in the same district where you student taught and you need to do this. And so I went in on like a Thursday I talked with the people, you know, the department, the school district. I got hired on that Friday and I started teaching that Monday. It was like this whirlwind. And when I say teaching, I mean like teacher in service. Right. right. However, it went from like not really knowing what I wanted to do to all of a sudden being in this amazing place that I really loved. And I thought, I'm going to teach for a year. Like this will just be until things get better. And then I'll just go to Northwest Airlines because I really want to do that before I get married, you know, right. yada, yada. Well, then 9-11 happens. And of course they send another letter saying, you know, not only has your position as a flight attendant been rescinded, but we are not hiring at all. In fact, we're starting to lay off. And so I finished that year of teaching. And in my second year of teaching, I met my husband and that's a whole other story, but I ended up moving to Texas. And I've been in Texas ever since, and I've now taught, I taught 14 years of elementary, and I'm going on my seventh year of teaching general music in middle school. And my life was just totally transformed by it. And even with that experience of teaching now, um, even yesterday, I had something happen where I just felt totally inadequate and going, it's hard right now. Like, I mean, I have lots of teaching experience. I have lots of levels courses and lots of great people around me and yesterday something happened and I was like I feel totally inadequate and you just keep moving forward you just keep going okay we'll take it a day at a time and then today I had something wonderful happen so you know you I, I feel like that's something I've I've learned over the years is just to take what comes at you sometimes you need to cry sometimes you need to talk with, you know, you were talking about therapy. That's so, I'm also a big believer in that and just doing the best you can with what you have. And you never know the path your life is going to take or the influence you'll have. So that was a lot to say, but hopefully, <laughs> hopefully that helps to get to know kind of a little of my background and, and where I am now. There is well, for, when you first start too, and you're like you know, inadequate, I'm like, were you listening to my therapist appointment today? <laughs> Was my phone connected with that? Because I, that is such a nail on the head. And I think so many people in life struggle with that, but music teachers are especially wrought with that because what we do is so it's cliche, but it is so personal. It's totally personal. And sometimes you try not to make it personal, but such music, such an emotional thing. And you invest all of you into the music and to the students. And we're just natural givers, I think, as teachers. To our detriment at times, many yes. times even as well. Yes. It, yeah. And you throw COVID in there and 
I'm kind of tired of talking about COVID, but at the same time, it's here. It's it's where we're at. But you throw in the uncertainties and the constant changes. Like you think it's going to go one way, and now it's going another, and it just um, it, it's a lot to take in. And then I feel for those new teachers who are going, "How do I? Is this really what teaching is? How do I juggle this? How do I find my place and get kind of a grounding?" for even a starting point. And even as experienced teachers, we're going, okay, I'm used to teaching this way, but now I have to shift my thinking and, right. and teach a different way. We're all really trying to figure out how we can continue to do our best and to give and to, to make things the best we possibly can. And it's, it's hard. <laughs> it's, it, you know, and in some ways I think it's almost harder on teachers that have been in the classroom during this period because there's nothing, um, like you have everything to compare it to versus a new teacher who doesn't have everything to kind of compare it to. But in both instances, you know, like one of the things I've been working on in therapy is like holding two dichotomous things at once. And I think whether you're a new teacher or an experienced teacher, whether you're a teacher right now, you are holding two things at once, right? Like the reality in which you're living and the, the dreams, whether they be past dreams and memories or future dreams that you have for um, yourself as an educator to give to your kids. Like you are, you're simultaneously holding both of those. And um it's, it's exhausting. It's exhausting, which is one of the things that I want to jump into because you more than anyone exude an authentic approach. So authentic about how you combat a lot of that. But before we get there, I, I want to touch on something that you don't hear from a lot of people. And I think is I want to celebrate this story, call attention to it, et cetera, is the fact that, you know, you going into music school did not intend to be a music teacher. Like, you know, you clearly had musical skills to show up, but how traumatic and like that can be, and I don't use that word lightly, but our music schools are not in that, well, in any setting, but especially in a university setting are set up for people that weren't put along a certain path to be successful, at least in my experience. And it seems like you had some of that as well. Yeah, it was, I had a lot of good mentors around me at my music school. I had my voice, um, my voice teacher was very encouraging, but she was almost more of a therapist than a vocal I, I mean don't get me wrong she was a vocal educator but what we did in our sessions was she spent a lot of time encouraging me and growing my growing my belief in myself and my ability and um, I remember going into one vocal jury and mind you I I've always felt like I had a good voice I have a very musical family. I know I'm not like made to be on albums or perform live or things like that, but I, I knew I could sing. I knew I could play the piano. I knew I had musical talent inside of me, but I never felt like it was better than what someone else could do. I, you know, and so those vocal juries were terrifying for me because even though in high school I'd perform in musicals, but I was always in the ensemble. Or if I did a solo, I would tell my parents don't show up because I would be too nervous knowing they were there. So as long as I didn't know who was listening, I was fine, but put me in a small room where I can see everyone's faces. And I would like, my voice would shake, my heart would pound. I would just struggle to really sing well. And I remember in one of my vocal juries at the end, you know, the teachers would write comments and one of the vocal teachers who was very like highly, looked up to and is really a fantastic educator wrote um, the comment of you're an upperclassman sing like one and that hurt because he didn't know my story of where I started he didn't know the steps that it took to you know by my junior year 
even get as far as I could. And yes, I may not have been as confident as some of these other people who came in knowing I'm going to be a vocal major. I want to sing on a label. I want to lead private lessons. I was never, that was never my path. I really didn't know what I was there for or why I was there. I just felt like it was the right step. So I did it. And uh, I feel like music school, and I think this is what you're getting at, is not a place for insecure. I, well, actually, everyone's insecure there, but but it's almost like you go through the fire in university. And I think that's what you were kind yeah. of talking about. It's just, it's it's really challenging. And I, I can't imagine even more today what that's like. Yeah. You know, but it's not what you meant. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a place where, you know, they um, give you space to figure it out. And there, there is a a certain level of rigor um, that is there. And to be fair, at a certain level is needed. Um, Absolutely. However, I was actually listening to a podcast last night that talked about, um, I'm really big into intergenerational trauma right now and, and how particularly parents today, and I say this not being a parent, but being an aunt and being just observant in the work that I'm doing personally of how this generation of folks that are mentoring younger people, be it in a parent or in, I also think it's relevant in a teacher setting too, very relevant there is a struggle to separate some of the trauma that was instilled upon us because not meaningfully, like it's not like people that taught us meant to instill that upon us. They were simply bringing on how they had been taught and carrying it on and carrying it on. But that has bled to us. And our generation is like really at this shift of saying, you know, holding high standards and demanding in a kind, loving, supportive way, right? Like bringing out high standards, but like, how do we do that without invoking trauma upon our students, like, and kids and stuff? Because we only know how to do some of that rigor through a level of trauma um, and writing comments, you know, like I'm just toughening them up or um, different things. I think it's a really hard, it's again, it's holding two things at once, right? Like we are still only at the beginning in music education for really unpacking that. And I think looking at growth is something that's often missed as well, because I know like in my classroom with my middle school students, I have students who come in at fifth grade who may be the only music experience they've had was in lower school where they had music for once a week, 40 minutes. But then you also have students, like I have one seventh grade boy who is the most phenomenal composer like literally the the music he writes is chilling it's beautiful it's almost like a great for like a movie soundtrack you know like he he just has a really creative mind and his giftings are encouraged through private lessons and through having another local composer who works with him and Now, mind you, that's probably far out. That's not where a lot of students are, but it's like, I have to look at the student has literally no music experience compared to a student who comes in with this amazing musical experience and try to teach them both in the same class and give them something that will encourage the one who struggles and push the one who has the gifts. And I think when we go to music school, you know, when I went, it was like, well, you should be a piano player. Everyone should know how to play piano in this way. And you are going to be graded on these things. Well, I had taken piano lessons since I was like six and I came in and that was really easy for me. And then I had friends who were like, I can read a singer's line in the treble clef because I'm a soprano, but I don't know the bass clef notes and I don't know how to do the patterns, but they were still tested as though they had played piano for years and I I do agree there has to be that rigor because that's what we're there for is to get pushed and to get better but I feel also that it's like we've got to look at the growth and maybe colleges do this better now I mean it's been years since I was in undergrad I've been I just finished my master's oh gosh like five years ago or so six years ago and so that uh 
that experience was phenomenal, but I didn't have the juries like I had before. I, it was more pinpointed to music education because at that point I knew exactly what I was targeting and exactly why I wanted to learn. But I, I appreciate what I was taught when I was an undergrad and it pushed me, but I always look back at that experience and still just feel like, gosh, if only they had kind of seen me for more of who I was and asked me more about myself. And I went to a small school, but it was like, I was just so inadequate and didn't really find much support in going, you're going to be an amazing teacher. I see this in you. I, how can I help you grow your confidence? What do you need? And instead it was like, well, we've got to get through this class, you know, and you need to have these skills ready to go. And I was really great at music theory. I was really great at music history, but the performance aspect needed a lot of help. And I think now as a teacher, I have to look at my students and go, where are they? What do you need? And maybe that's more of the SEL conversation that we have now. But I, I know how much it means to my middle schoolers to know, okay, I see you. I'm here for you. Today was a rough day. Let's start again tomorrow. Let's see what you can do tomorrow. And if they feel like they can't do one kind of music skill, let's see what you can do in this area. Okay, maybe you struggle in playing the recorder and your fingers, you struggle with motor skills. And But maybe playing the drums, you don't struggle as much and you've got a better feel because of the way you're touching the instrument and you're really great there. Let's see what more we can do and, and just telling students, I see this in you. Right. And let's see how far we can go. Okay, you're struggling here. Let's see how far. And I just think, you know, we learn from, we learn from the hardest times sometimes the most, even though they're the most painful. And, you know, like I said, obviously that, that comment that that professor said to me in that vocal jury has stung. And I remember it because then it was like, well, I guess I'm not a good singer. And it was like, I'm, I'm a great singer. Like I have a really nice tone and I have a good voice, but in that jury, when I was nervous and I see him staring at me, intimidating me, and I just, you know, you freeze and whatever. So I, I think there's so much we can give our students if we're vulnerable enough to not just look at the music skills, but to also see them as people. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So it's so interesting um, hearing that perspective and also knowing this side of, you know, how you show up online for music educators. And again, I go back to the word like authentic. You are the most uh, of anyone, hands down, the most authentic. And what I'm hearing too, is that it's like this theme and thread in your life that carries its way into that, which is no more should we focus as we were taught to focus on that of achievement. Um, instead it's focusing on growth. And while that's all like sexy and fun to say, and, you know, buzzy to you know, all the things, yeah. <laughs> um, you embody that within your personal life as well and how you are always growing your personal side. I mean, like one of my favorite things. And so then I think that that only makes it more authentic for how you can show up for your students in your classroom, because it's not just something you're practicing and, and thinking about from a social emotional learning SEL perspective there, but you're, it is, it's a something that is, that is you. And it's, potentially a struggle for the music teacher that compartmentalizes that mm -hmm. or you know we seek achievement in other areas of our life but then like oh yeah, yeah but I need to be like focused on this and the growth of my students and get it and we don't carry that same love and kindness and care into who we are as people and we focus on our personal achievements which then drive us to think like I am good enough I'm not good enough they're better yeah blah, 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 blah. Um, and you, but you do that and you do that in ways that aren't always musical. So one of my favorite things that you've done, like I love to go online and see, um, was you probably don't even know what I'm saying, when you did the Joanna Gaines cookbook. Oh, no way. I love, 
<laughs> yes. So you like cooked a different recipe from her cookbook, right? Okay. Yes. So I, I adore Joanna Gaines anyway, but when she came out with the cookbook, it was like just, what was it like 2019 or it was kind of before all the COVID yeah. stuff hit. So what's funny about it is that I always set yearly goals. I'm big on setting goals because I feel like it gives me a focus on the things that really matter to me. And it helps me look at different categories and just working towards being what I would say healthy, just in the areas that I really feel are important to me for whatever reason, right? So one of the goals I had set in 2020 was to cook a different meal every Saturday for my family. Uh, yeah, every Saturday for my family from the Joanna Gaines cookbook. But here's the wild thing about that. And I guess it goes, it, it's interesting that you're pointing to things in my life because I'm like, wow, this is totally a thread. But I was not cooking in our family like for years at all. My daughter wrote on like a Mother's Day thing where it's like, my mom is this tall and my mom is, you know, whatever. And yep. they put in different things. It said, my mom cooks and it was a blank. And it was my mom cooks good ramen. And that was what my daughter associated with my cooking. So I was the mac and cheese mom and the ramen mom, but my husband is this phenomenal cook. And he started cooking back in our first year of marriage when he lost his job because he was home and he was like, this is something I can do. Right. And all of a sudden he took off, realized he was great. So fast forward, like 15 years, 14 years. I'm like, you know what? I would really like to like try some new meals, but I really want to get in the kitchen and start cooking. And so I made a goal to do it every Saturday because I knew it would give me time to really figure out. And this is sad, but I was like, okay, where's the carrot peeler? Is it in this drawer? Or is it in this peel, this drawer, you know? And I'm like, okay, we've got the wooden spatula, but to like, do I use this for that? Like it was pretty sad. And so the first couple of weeks he had to actually stand in the kitchen and he was so sweet about it. And I'd be like, okay, can you tell me like, is this medium high heat? And it, if the, you know, if it's set like this, I mean, I knew what a boil was and all of that, but I really had to learn from him how to use, you know, meat thermometers. And it's not like it was hard, but it took time and it took willingness to go. I don't know what I'm doing, but I want to see if, you know, if we can find some new meals. And so every meal, it's like Joanna Gaines can't do anything wrong. It's like insane, you know? So I started cooking like these different meals and all of a sudden we found all these new family favorite meals. And then Julia would come in and she'd be like, Hey, let's, you know, she flipped the cookbook. She's like, let's do this meal today. And she and I would go to the store and then she'd make it with me. And then Riley would choose a dessert or we'd plan like the month ahead and kind of get you know, food going, or if there was a dessert we really loved, we would go ahead and have it on Saturday and there'd be so much of it that I would call a few neighbors and we'd bring them slices of it to our neighbors to share with them. Cause we're like, Hey, this turned out really good. We can't eat it, but we want to share what we've made with you. And so then some of the neighbors were like, okay, I'm totally getting that cookbook. So then they started buying the cookbook and making the meals for their families. But the Saturday meal thing was really, it brought our family together. It gave me just a new thing that I could do that was like de-stressing. And of all years, it was during the COVID year when we were stuck at home anyway, where all of us or many of us made bread from scratch. You know, like we ran out of the flour at the stores and they ran out of the yeast in the stores. So it was like, well, I can't make bread this week. So we'll make something else. But it's really become a special thing for our family. And so I made it a goal for this year as well. And now it's been, you know, a year and a half of making new meals and repeating new meals. And yeah. Oh, that's so wild that that stood out to you. Cause it's been such a fun thing for our family. Well, and like, what an amazing testament to the fact, like I had no idea of that <laughs> story whatsoever for all I knew, like you were the master chef in your house and you were like rolling up and just like adding to, I mean, I like have chills thinking about 
the power of that, again, power of social media the, and seeing someone and I would have like gone out and tried it, even not knowing all of that, but gosh, like the testament to trying something new, to building relationships with your husband and your kids and your neighbors, like. And it sounds idyllic. Like, I mean, obviously there's other, you know, there was one story where I didn't realize like that Julia didn't know that chicken that we eat is the same thing as chickens that are animals. Like we don't live in a, yeah. you know, a yeah, farm, yeah, we're in the city. Yeah. And so we did this meal that involved uh, like bone in chicken. I forget mm-hmm. what it was like thighs or whatever it was. And she's looking at, and there was blood and she's like, um, is this blood? And I was like, yeah, you know, it's chicken. And she's like, well, yeah, but why would it have blood? And I'm like, cause it's from a chicken. Like this is the chicken's leg. And all of a sudden it hit her and she started crying. <laughs> she's like, we're eating chickens. I can't eat the chicken. And you know, like, <laughs> and like, I mean, it was so funny, but then I started trying to make things better. And I was like, well, we'll just call it George. Then we won't call it a chicken. We'll call it George. And George was fine. And Jeremy's like, you are ruining this. You're, this is getting worse. And so it became this big joke later. It took her several days to like be okay eating chicken. I'm so proud of her for like actually eating it again. But I mean, it, it does sound idyllic. Like look at this happy family and we just perfectly make meals. And, but I think, you know, every family has their stuff. Right. But I think this throughout COVID was the one, well, not just the one, but it was one of the things that brought our family so much joy when we were stuck at home. And it was you know, we all have to find that thing that feeds us and feeds our family, like literally, I guess, um, and figuratively, but that just allows us to kind of breathe and get away from the school stuff because school was so heavy that knowing, you know what, on Saturday, I can spend four hours letting bread rise. I can try this thing. And, you know, there were tons of fails like the cheesecake I made for Riley's birthday where the pan ended up soaked in water and it just totally did not work so we just ate the top of it and then there was a flourless chocolate cake that it looked like a pile of like cow dung like it was so bad but it tasted like so good and so we just you know we didn't share that with the neighbors but it was it was really just a way to really heal from all the stress that was going on at work and to step away. And I will say, I think with the music education stuff and just what I went through in college and then right before getting my teaching job and even now with you know the meals and COVID and family, I think the one thing that I've learned is just to try. You never know if you don't try. And I think that's where sometimes we hold ourselves back because we're like, well, I failed at that. It's like, but you got to try again and having, even if you're struggling to believe that you can do something, just knowing it's like, okay, I'm not a failure. I, I just, you know, what was it? It took, uh, who invented the light bulb? Edison. <laughs> like it took Edison, like a thousand tries to get the right, you know, configuration for making it work. But then finally he found the one way. And I think it's the never giving up and just going, start new, start fresh. Sure. Yesterday hurt. Okay. You'll, you'll heal from that hurt, but don't be afraid to try. And I think that's, you know, with the cookbook that helped us find new meals and, you know, just through music education, it's helped me never give up trying new things. And I, I do think that's something that I'm positive about doing and that can be really helpful in keeping you going. It's it again, it goes back to that thread of growth over achievement, right? And if we're not yeah. careful, um, based on how we were brought up in music and even our school systems, I was a whole other bucket of water <laughs> like open, but you know, as we continue to steer away from that achievement based thinking musically, personally, relationally, all the things, um, to thinking about the growth that we are making. And that that is uh, really where the magic happens. But, you know, I look at um, the work that I know that you have done from a goal setting perspective. 
And I mean, I've just like seen some of your Excel sheets and like all the, I mean, I'm just like, oh, <laughs> um, personally, I mean, like I love goals and like designing them and making them beautiful and like, da, 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 da. but I have two problems. One is I dream too big. Like my eyes are bigger than my stomach, which is also related to food and accurate, but <laughs> I get in and I don't, I don't keep up with my path always, or it like gets wonky. And I'm not saying that you're perfect. And you're just like, I'm definitely not. Way. Yeah. <laughs> but that's an, another thing that, again, I, I admire and I'm, I, I want to dig into how do you go about when you set a goal, breaking it down to where it's attainable and the steps are attainable and then sticking to those steps, even when you don't stick always to them. Yeah. I talk about this a lot with my older daughter who's 14, because a lot of times, you know, we'll talk about setting goals or things she wants to work towards or the things that are important to her. And she's like, I just feel like I can't keep up with it. I feel like it's hard to make it work because I really want something to happen. But then in the day to day, you just life takes over. And then it's like, well, I've either forgotten it or it feels too hard to work towards. And so we've talked about that. And I think that's important with students too, about letting them know you can set a goal to work towards, and you might never reach that goal. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of that cheesy saying where, you know, reach for the moon and you might hit the stars or whatever. Right. right. But I think something that works for me is I like to prioritize the things that are important to me. And I've figured that out by setting lots of goals over the years and finding out what's really important to me by what I'm actually working towards. And I'll, I'll kind of break that so What I'm down. hearing you say is you focus on the growth of building goals instead of the achievement of setting the, the goals. It's oh my gosh. <laughs> That is exactly what I do, even though I'm very achievement oriented, like I'm a Enneagram three, like a very much, I go after things and, but it's, it's, that's exactly what it is. Um, that should be like my whole slogan, like growth, not achievement. I don't know, uh, but it's wild. I would not have ever seen that in myself without you saying it. Uh, but yeah, I said, you know, like this year, and this might sound absurd. They usually say to set like one or two goals, you know, like only set one or two goals because you can only focus on one thing at a time. Then yes, that's true. Unless you set the one goal and it's like you were talking about, maybe so big, you can't reach it. And then you feel frustrated and you're like, I'm not good at keeping goals. I can't possibly go after it. But what I do is I see like categories in my life that are important, like um, taking care of my health matters to me because if I, like, I like running, um, if I go for a run or I do yoga or I, I kind of keep this spreadsheet of my running miles because I like to make goals for the year of running a particular amount. Okay. And what then I track like by month and by day and whatever, which might be too much for some people. But I know if I take care of that side of me that I sleep better, which means I'm a happier person, which means that I'm able to focus at work better. And the one thing that that comes down to is the running for somebody else. Maybe it's more of the diet or the foods um, that hits me. Of course. I mean, I've been eating so much chocolate lately because I'm stressed, but I love chocolate. However, I also know that affects me. So then you have to figure out how to kind of balance out the foods you need for other people. Maybe it's their nighttime routine or spending time reading or spending time listening to podcasts and things that can encourage them, maybe that are unrelated to work, kind of figuring out what do you enjoy doing and why do you enjoy doing it? So for me, the running allows me to sleep better, it, you know, like that progression I shared. And so then you think about, okay, my family has to eat. I really have enjoyed cooking these meals. I'm gonna set a goal once a week to cook a meal that we've either cooked before from one cookbook, because if I focus on just, I'm going to cook a new meal, then it's like, well, where are you going to get the meal? What kind of ingredients do you need? And if you stick to one cookbook or one website, it's a focal point. And even if the meals all have lots of cheese in them, or they all have the same kinds of pasta, it's like, 
it's fine because then you're pinpointing exactly where you're going to pull your material from. You know, for teaching, I might focus on, okay, my eighth graders this year, you know, something that's a challenge for me this year is going, I know my eighth graders have not had the same musical experience as would have been typical over the last year and a half. So I don't want to look at them as being behind, but I need to know where I need to start with them. So how am I going to do a pre-assessment? So with that pre-assessment, figuring out where their skill level is, what those concepts are that they do remember, but doing it in a way that for eighth graders isn't boring, you know, isn't like, great, I've entered into music and now we have to write a whole bunch of music symbols and like doing it in a creative way that is using movement so I can see their patterns that is using instruments and assessing using the musical tools and instruments and body percussion and voice through speech so that they are doing and demonstrating rather than just like writing out okay here's a quarter note well they can tell it to me they can show it to me they can speak it so trying to do that and I think by setting goals in those different areas you don't get bored and you don't get to that point of going where you just feel like you're not good at doing the things you want to do and getting frustrated at yourself and beating yourself up over well that didn't work and I'm just not good at this and I'm not good at anything and I'm never going to get anywhere and instead again saying we'll just try again tomorrow and if this is really important to work on, give yourself time to work on it. And then if your life changes and you have to pivot, it's okay to pivot. We're not robots. We weren't made to set a goal and then do it every day at one o'clock without fail for an hour. And like life would be so boring like that. And so really working in what's important to you and maybe making a list of the things that are important to you. You know, are you wanting, like, are you wanting to learn to garden? Well, if you're wanting to learn to garden, do you have a space for it? Would you start with maybe just herbs on your kitchen windowsill? Or are you wanting to make something outside in your backyard and start there? Are, are you in vegetables? You know, and you kind of have to think of a few of the details behind your goals to really understand how you're going to implement it. Because like I was saying with cookbooks, if you just go, I'm going to cook a new meal. Well, are you going to cook lunch? Are you going to cook dinner? Are you going to make a breakfast? Are you going to do it how many times a week? You know, and you hear all about the SMART goals, but sometimes I feel like that can also be overwhelming because you can overwhelm yourself going, ah, I have to make it attainable and I have to make it, you know, time manageable or whatever else. And then you get so caught up in making sure your goal is, meeting all this criteria that you don't just sit down and go, well, what really matters to me? Okay. If my family is important and time with my family is important, then what time is that? Is that spending time in the morning talking with your kids? Is it time after school? Is it time after dinner? And you know, it, every one of us has different things that are important to us. And I think that should be totally okay it feeds one another, right? Like yeah. the more we take care of ourselves, the more we can take care of our students. And I, um, it's something I, I strive to continue in this phase of my life because it was something that the more I took care of myself in the classroom and even modeled that within my rehearsals at times, right? Like I loved when you said like, let's brain, even from a personal level, brainstorming ideas of what would be things. And I think that is the perfect example of if you are doing that in your daily life, there's no reason you can't take that into your classroom. Oh, of course. And you're brainstorming what their different goals are. And then when we begin to stress out about like the smart goals and da, 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 I sometimes feel, oh, don't sometimes. I I very much so feel that the smartest goal of all is the correctly scaffolded goal. So picking that one thing and then also to your point, right? Like what are all of the steps that you have to get from point A to point Z and even working with students to figure that out and seeing when some students jump and some students don't and re like what a cool thing to model into like, I think there's this pressure that we oftentimes feel too is 
as teachers um, and any setting, right? Elementary, middle, high, community, church, and period, right? To come with all the answers, right? And to come with the perfect lesson plan. And that's just not, A, it's Lord, not feasible because whoever came <sighs> up with that never had email as a teacher before. <laughs> so like, yeah, but that's the education. Yes. And letting your student, I mean, they always say, let your students see you fail. But I think also let your students see you talk it out in front of them and go, hold on. You know, like I've gone, when I first started teaching middle school, I've gone to teach a melody and realized, oh, oh my gosh, like on the bard instruments, I don't remember what the next phrase is. And like it was in my mind, I've practiced it ahead of time because, you know, middle schoolers, their technique and stuff is way beyond what I had been used to in the lower school classrooms. And so it would go, you know what, here's the thing. I practiced this. I was going to be ready to teach it. And now that I'm teaching it to you, I remembered that first phrase. I forgot the second phrase. And then I can remember going, not only did I forget the second phrase, but I didn't really clearly think through exactly how I can teach this to you for you to understand it. Because now I understand how to play it, but I'm realizing it as I'm teaching it that they're not getting it. And so then you go and you talk through and go, because middle schoolers, you can be so frank with them and honest and just go, you know what? I was thinking I would teach it this way, but it's not working. Maybe let me try it this way. And if it doesn't work, we're going to come up with something else. And just pivoting on the spot and admitting, maybe I don't know really what. I'm doing, even though I thought I knew what I was doing, and then I forgot what I was doing. But I, I think it comes down to being really honest. And I feel like that's really easier with middle school, high school on. Of course, you can be honest with the younger ones, but their knowledge skills, a kindergartner cannot go, oh, well, you should do this next step. Or what about right. this? You know, I mean, they can supply improvisation words in like, you know, or they'll songs all they or whatever want. Oh my yeah. gosh, yes. Yeah, but like middle schoolers, there are kids, seventh, eighth grade, who will go, you know what? I thought it sounded like this, or what if this? And then you can jump off what they shared. And my students have often inspired, like, that's a great way of teaching it. I never thought of that. And um, yeah, but I, I just think admitting, I don't, that we're, we really don't know what we're doing 100% of the time, and that's okay, but also talking students through what you were thinking as you were doing it, because they're smart enough to get that, and they also respect that, where it's like, you know what, you're not perfect, it's like, absolutely not, I'm not, but I am open to go, I, I need help with this or what's your idea? And I'm open to go, I am smart enough to know what I'm doing or I am smart enough to have done this thing, but maybe it's not working. So what do you think? And uh, yeah. And I don't know what your experiences were, but I was, especially in a collegiate setting, not always <laughs> like that. Oh gosh, no, it was the teacher lectures. I'm telling you the right thing. This is the only correct way to teach you this material. And I think a lot of my openness to this really came through my ORF levels training because when I did, and I, I love the Kodai approach as well. I think they both blend and merge beautifully together and they both have, have strengths, right? But when I did my Kodai training, and that was another area where it was like, oh my gosh, I have to get the solfege perfectly correct. And I, I need to, in the musicianship classes, demonstrate that I am on an equal footing, if not better, to sight read these examples. And, you know, it's a lot of high pressure. And how we present it to students, of course, matters. But when I got to my ORF training, it was, what do you think? And how could we do it differently? There is a gray area for what this could look like or what this could sound like. Okay, great, you chose to do this improvisation with the pentatonic scale using these pitches and this rhythm, but check out how somebody else did it. And of course, when it comes down to composition, then 
you can make decisions of this is the way we're going to do it. We're all going to learn it the same. You know, when you're structuring a piece, this is how we're going to create the form of the piece. This is the final. And if a student's like, but I would like to do this, you go, this is just how we're going to do it. Because you have to have a decision, right. you know, a decision point. Right. But I, I do believe the ORF levels training gave me that as a teacher. And that was another jumping off point for me because I had always learned and always taught as a teacher that this is how we do things. And here is the rhythm. And here is the next progression for teaching musical concepts. And then you open up to ORF where there's this whole new way of getting student feedback, incorporating ideas and being able to go, here's my lesson plan, but leaving room for students to share their ideas and then being able to go with their ideas, that takes a whole new way of thinking and implementing, not better, but different. And as teachers, I think we grow into the areas that we not only are comfortable in, but we also have to find out what meets our students where they are. And that could be the more structured classroom that could be one that's a little more open to interpretation and student input but you know your students better than anyone and it it's just a matter of learning them and doing what they need I think that in and of itself too aligns with what you were sharing earlier about the um, social emotional learning constructs but also where as some students are we oftentimes think of of students strengths within the context of motors like in a general music classroom but also in a choir or band classroom I guess that even aligns more but like this is their strength in this and this is their strength in that but so oftentimes we have structured our rehearsals and I would venture to say that high school choral classrooms are the guiltiest of all of this that say this is what we do and da, 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 and da, 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 right and so that was one of the things that I love most. I'm actually laughing because I, I was pitching to someone recently for a community thing. I said, like, I don't know if we want to do a performance right now. Like, I want to do a little bit more exploration that is built on improvisation and da 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 da. And I have no doubt if they'd experienced it, they would have been like, heck yeah. But even that person as a chorister was like, no, I want a concert, and we sometimes hear that and we're like, oh, I gotta feel, but forget that. We, I, I think we have to really let go of that more and more and more because when we offer some of those varied approaches into a general music classroom, Lord, general music and choir and band, it's all the same. Um, but we provide those different opportunities and those different opportunities then align itself to observing the growth within students. Um, and that's, that's what we want is that like engagement to music. Yeah. I can't, I can't help but think too, like, as we're describing this and, you know, this is like one of the first conversations I've had also about music pedagogy and like this detailed and in life and all the things in, in a while. And I think about the work that I do now every day in corporate America. And I hesitate to bring that up because I, it's like a sensitivity spot if we're being super vulnerable it's like because people are like how are you a quiet you can be both yes i'm still working to own and claim that because that is an insecurity of mine um in this new phase of life which i i knew it would be but more than ever more than ever we need that for our students because if they don't get that now, we are at risk of them never having that as adults. And it's critical to their success. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, um, it gives me all the ideas and all, and all of the thoughts, but we, um, are winding down on our time here. And I know we talked a lot, um, and we hopefully gave you the listeners, um, inspiration, right? Like, listen, there are a million different podcasts on, on music theory. There are even some within choir baton too, but like choir music, all that it is personal and we are better teachers. We are better musicians and leaders when we are aligned. And if you are not following Jessica on Instagram, you must, 
If you have not listened to her podcast, which this is where I knew she'd like jam out with me on this because like it's aligned to music education, but also living your best life. Download, subscribe, all the things. Is it on like all the plot podcast platforms? Just yes. So okay. my podcast is called Afternoon T T I like the Soulfish, and it's on any all the things streaming service. Yep. And because I know you just like have to dive into everything, you this last year released your book. I did, and I'm so grateful for the work Sarah Goulish and the F Flat books community does. In fact, Sarah was really instrumental in helping me get the book going because I had already, I had actually started writing it in 2019 and then put it to a halt at the beginning of 2020, but I didn't tell anyone I was writing it because I was too nervous to share. And then I talked to Sarah and just got a lot of inspiration and encouragement from her. And it came out, it's called The Afternoon Tea Guide to Teaching Music. And the biggest part of the book is actually the journal, I think, because I, I've seen a lot of people have purchased the book, which is great. You can read that, consume the content, but I think it's the outgrowth of writing down using the journal prompts that really is really the whole point of why I wrote the book was to make it personalized for other educators. So the journal is this, you know, accompaniment and it's all about, you know, why you became a teacher. Here are some, you know, lesson structures you could use, thinking through how you structure lessons, giving you lesson ideas, and then taking that and going, how can you personalize that? How do you use building blocks in the classroom? Okay, now make your own. Okay, now set a lesson plan. Now there's notes. Try improvisations, try compositions, and I guide you through all of that as well as talking through classroom management ideas and ideas for incorporating technology and really helping you find your voice as an educator. So the book isn't so much about, oh, look at how much I know. It's more about, these are some of the things I've learned. Take it, personalize it, and see what, what it inspires you to do. Right. And I think that is more critical than ever. And that's where I, I just, ugh, I love it because, you know, you and I have been on this like music teacher, Instagram world for a number of years. And I mean, truly a number of years now, and we have really seen it shift and change. And I would be lying if I didn't say like, I miss those days. I kind of miss those days. I mean, I love, I love it now and I love seeing people and stuff now, but I think, um, we are really at risk of a feeling like we need to copy exactly what someone else is doing based off of what we see on Instagram, which is a lie because there's no way we could actually copy it because it's your own classroom. It's your own style. It's your own students. It's all the things that are, that are you. Um, and it, that's just unattainable. And simultaneously, we are overwhelmed with all of the different ideas and it really, and, and then that leads into that like imposter syndrome and, and I'm not good enough and they're a better music and they're a better teacher and they have this and they have that and, and you can spin out. I like don't even have yes. a, a full-time classroom anymore. And I'm like, my classroom never looked at I'm like, Beth, get over it. Like it, you don't even have a classroom anymore. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Um, like I was, I, I took down at my last school, I was there for three years and I took down the bulletin board. I put up when I got there, when I left, that was the same for three, like it, we are at risk of, of spinning out on that and looking, I'm going to bring it back again, but it fits looking towards what exists on social media as a measurement of achievement versus your book is the opportunity for you to lean in and really develop your personal growth as a music educator, because that's what it's all about. Yeah, that's about you as an individual and the work you do with your students, regardless of what others are doing around you. Great to be inspired by others, of course, but absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you again. This has been um, like, whew just refreshing. Can I wait for people to listen? They can find you on Instagram. They can find your podcast, um, buy the book from F flat. It is maybe available other places, but it is F flat. We want to support F flat. Amazon. 
but we want to, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> it is available okay. as a, uh, it's available as a, um, what do you call that? Not hardcover, but soft oh. cover. Okay. Um, on Amazon, but I only did that for if people wanted to really have the handheld. My ideal would be to purchase it from F flat because right. their work is incredible. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. If you've not checked out um, them, please do so. There's also an episode we can um, link here to where it was like right at the beginning with Sarah and all of this stuff and um, getting some excitement going for her and the work she is doing there. Um, so again, yeah. thank you, Jessica. Any closing thoughts or places where people can connect with you or, or anything you want to leave with uh, folks listening and watching today? I think just to share my Instagram handle so that you can find it, it's at high afternoon tea. So it's at H I G H the word afternoon and then T I like the code I symbol, but yeah, I'm, I'm just so grateful to have been able to talk with you and share. And I hope it was helpful and inspiring. I know it was, I know it was. Thanks Jessica. Hey, Quiet Baton listeners, August 16th, 2021 through August 31st, the Choir Baton Teaching Membership is open to new members. Now, the Choir Baton Teaching Membership is an online resource for choir teachers to access curated information to help you be successful and feel supported throughout the school year. This year, there's no doubt that we need all of the help we can get, and CBTM seeks to be that integral resource for you. Now, in the Choir Baton Teaching Membership, you have access to all of the information from last school year, from now until December 2021, and you'll continue to gain access to all of the new content for this school year, now past that date of December 2021. You will also uh, have within this new content for the year a rotation of a curated hack lesson, assessment, or choir builder each week sent to you via email and also accessible in your membership. Listen, you are short on time always, and this enables you to be able to go through and and get information quickly, efficiently, know where it's at, no scrolling, looking through all the different folders or screenshots that you've taken. It's all in the Choir Baton Teaching Membership for you. So if you want to learn more, click the link in the show notes. And if you're listening to this after August 31st, you can still go to the Choir Baton website and sign up to be on the waiting list. And I will send you an email the next time the membership opens again. As always, thanks for listening to the Choir Baton podcast, where we're all about more people singing.